गुड इवनिंग उन्नीस सर गुड इवनिंग गुड आफ्टरनून इट्स ओनली टू ओ क्लॉक It's already evening for Prakash. Yeah, for him, he has already declared. Baby, baby, after Vishakarma Puja, he thought. <laughs> so he, it was celebrated quite nicely. People were there. Vishakarma Puja went over very well. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In the morning. No, after COVID. Ono was actively involved. You know, he started the whole. इमीडिएटली Right. Only the thing is that you know you have to meet these people quite often. That is very much needed. If yes. you don't meet them uh, somehow by now online or some physical meet these people, talk to them each other, and you have to activate them. See, otherwise, like you know, Angkor Pan Sai Kya, very, very, uh, very, <coughs> very, very, very uh, hardworking person. Yes, it's very yeah. hardworking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So there are some people like in the Bhairav is the uh, Bhairagi is there. There are some people I still recollect, and we also lost some of the very good people from mechanical engineering, civil engineering. Also, we lost. The, some of them has gone to Assam Public Service Commission. Seven yes. people selected, you know, in one batch from our university. Um, that was a big loss for us. Ah, yes. True, sir. What happened? He very is, you know, as he joined. Yeah, yeah. We should start. लेक्चर Eight Chancellor Lecture Series organized by Assam Downtown University. I am extremely honored and feel privileged to welcome Dr. Swapna Bhattacharjee, Senior Consultant, Department of Medicine, Cam, Deputy Medical Superintendent, Downtown Hospital in charge, um, Department of Accident and Emergency, Downtown Hospital, HOD, Department of Family Medicine for DNB Studies, for taking time off from your busy schedule to be the guest speaker. Dr. Bhattacharjee will speak on the topic Emergencies Outside the Hospital. Sir, I sincerely hope that your lecture will inspire and motivate the students, faculties, and researchers of the university. Once again, I welcome all of you for this lecture series. Now, I would like to request Professor Sunanan Borwa to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. Swapna Bhattacharjee. Thank you so much, Nishan, and a warm welcome to each and every one to the eighth lecture in the Editu Chancellor's Lecture Series. Uh, we are we are extremely happy to have with us. today dr shapna bhatakur who has immense experience in uh, handling emergencies and he is in charge of the emergency wing of our own hospital downtown hospital uh, i would like to take the opportunity to introduce him to all of you so dr shapna bhatakur is a senior consultant department of medicine come dip he is the deputy medical superintendent of the downtown hospital guwahati since 2007 he is in charge of the department of accident and emergency downtown hospital the head of the department department of family medicine for dnb studies he is a national external assessor for nqas nhs rs of the government of india 
Uh, he's a visiting faculty of our university here. Dr. Botagur's research interests are in the fields of diabetes, thyroid disorders, gastroenterology, and respiratory diseases. So a very active uh, person, and uh, he has vast experience in handling disasters uh, related from accidents and uh, the emergencies. And uh, we look forward to listening to his deliberations today on the topic, emergencies outside the hospital. So uh, I will pass on the stage now to Dr. Shona Bhattakur. So it's all yours, Dr. Bhattakur. Thank you, Dr. Sunanan Borwa. Yeah, it's uh, my privilege uh, that uh, I have been called upon to talk about a, a topic in this university or a very good topic, uh, which is really uh, important. But the main issue is that it's something which is outside the hospital. I'm doing emergencies mostly inside the hospital. But here what the main issue is that emergencies come to our hospital after they had already had something there. So based on that, uh, I, would, I was suggested to talk on what necessary precautions or what should be done before a patient actually requires uh, a hospital, uh, actually comes and gets to a hospital, what is his requirement and what is the, because of the time lag, what necessary precautions we can take. So based on that, today's presentation has been started. So I'll just start sharing right now. So it's emergencies, but we are managing it outside the hospital. That is what we need to do. So when we talk about that, the main issue which comes out when I am outside the hospital is what is the uh, emergency, an unfortunate combination of circumstances or the resulting state that calls for immediate action. But the main basis, what is an emergency when we talk, and we something from a pinprick uh, to a huge disaster outside the uh, whole, getting the whole community or the whole country or the whole world as such. So it's emergency is something which is serious, unexpected, and often dangerous. It's a situation which requires immediate action. So basically, if all these things are provided, we can say it's an emergency. The Indian constitution gives the president the authority to declare three types of emergencies, the national emergency, the state emergency, and the financial emergency. So if we talk about emergency, it will be a lot of issues. But what we are more important or interested about is emergencies which are basically near to our heart. So that is with the public health emergencies. Emergencies, which includes uh, damp spills, failures, droughts, earthquakes, extreme heats, fire, floods, hurricanes, all over the world, terrorist attacks, bioterrorism, thunderstorms, or any tornadoes. And recently, the mainly 2009 swine flu pandemic and the COVID-19 pandemic, which is going around. So these are public health emergencies, which goes around the world. But according to, again, uh, we can say it's something which is related to death, which is related to our health, or which is related to our environment. The death and health is something which is more important, which is more emergency, which is situation which we as humans believe in. But there are also environmental emergencies, which directly or indirectly do affect us. So there's are different types of emergencies. Coming to us, what we are talking today about public health emergencies, why is it important and where does it work? More nearer is that we won't be talking about that is our medical and surgical emergencies, which is my part. And that is why I'm standing today to talk in at length, I hope so, about uh, medical and surgical emergencies which we encounter, uh, taking into context the whole layout of emergencies which can occur to us. An acute injury or illness that poses an immediate risk to a person's life or long-term health, sometimes referred to as a situation risking a life or a limb. But in context, I would also like to tell that a child at one o'clock having a fever is an emergency for his parents. So when they came up with this, we cannot say that is not an emergency. It's not that a huge pandemic which kills lots of people is only a, a, a medical or a surgical emergency. Even a small aspect can be an emergency for the individualized patient at home. So what we are talking about is three aspects. One is an emergency which is situated in our home. 
One is a worldwide uh, pandemic or a worldwide situation of emergency. And one which is based in our community, which we are a part of. Yes, we are a part of the world, but we are also part of the immunity. Uh, I mean, the community where our aspect of our entrance, what we give or what we can do is much more than what we can do for the whole world. Here, the main thing which comes while I'm talking about this is that our role in the emergencies. If we take into context the amount of people, as uh, I'm taking into context the COVID-19, it becomes easier for us to explain, is that one on one side, there's a healthcare workers, one is the common people. Everybody is appreciating that the health workers, we are working uh, at length. Yes, but it's not only the healthcare workers which can make or do the whole or treat or care for the whole aspect of an emergency. It's individualized persons at their own levels have to be a part of this emergency in their working, then only it becomes true. So the health work workers are associated with, as we have seen in floods, armies coming in, police are working in our pandemics, also different aspects of fire workers have to be there because of different issues. So even if there are disasters or uh, many other aspects of a pandemic or an epidemic, there are different peoples who are affected and also who are working at links. So my question is about the common people. Where do we stand? The common people stand because as we seen in the pandemic, if individually level, if we do not work for us to control the pandemic, then it's not going to work. At an individualized level, we are wearing masks, uh, we are taking social distancing, we are taking vaccines. We are part of the system and we have a part in work making the system work. So the role of public in emergencies is very big. It's not only in a big pandemic or in a small aspect when somebody falls down, but in the aspect when I am talking about the issues of medical and surgical emergencies that occur in our community or when we see someone having an emergency in our vicinity. What do we need to do? So that is how to handle emergency situations. We go to the topic first. The main issue I would suggest that all the handle uh, emergency situations, the three things which works from the first to the last is the three C's. Number one is check. Number two is call. Number three is care. Number one is check. Check your environment. What is happening to us? Where is it happening? Is it conducive to the environment? Yes or no? Or do we need to change it? That is check. Check the patient. What is the situation of the patient? Is he safe? Is he conscious? Is he dead? The check the condition of the patient. Call. Call is different numbers in around the world have different aspects who you call. Yeah, I think 108 is a big issue here. We call for everybody. But there are different numbers for fire, different numbers for police. So we should all know what are the calls. And thirdly, care. What do we need to do? And that is what I'm talking today about care. As we talk about different scenarios, the first that comes to mind for everybody is a person collapsing on the middle of the road. But before that, there is something going on in that person. Sudden unexpected loss of heart function, breathing and consciousness is what we all suppose to be a cardiac arrest. But that is not so. Before that, when the heart does not get the blood, it needs the cells get damaged, heart muscles die due to oxygen deficiency. When a major portions of the cardiac cells die, it leads to a heart attack. So we have the heart attack, which is the accumulation of a long period of other process, which is going on inside the body, which ab abruptly makes the heart stop breathing and then it can result in death of a person. So we need prompt intervention. And that intervention is within 30, 60 to 90 minutes. So survival is possible if the patient gets treated within 90 minutes of the attack, when the patient collapses. So the time period is very crucial. So what are our work? What do we need to do that? The main part, what our part is to make the patient conscious and shift him to another place. During that period, there's a time lag. When the ambulance comes, you are calling someone or you're picking up the patient or from home, you are taking him somewhere, it takes time. What are things we need to do? So that is basic life support. Basic life support encompasses a total uh, continuous process where you uh, call for help, start with CPR, and then advanced life support comes. During the stay, you have to check the patient, 
check for the vital signs and then call emergencies so that 108 or anybody comes out and then lift then start your CPR process. I won't go through the CPR processes because CPR is something which is not, uh, I think most of the healthcare workers now is mandatory that we know a CPR, but as in other countries, it's, uh, it's, it is basically most of the people, even common people should know basic CPR, what to do when emergency arises. CPR is not only for a cardiac arrest, for any patient who is going in unconsciousness, CPR is a mandatory part. So we should all be talking about it. Basically, Sir. Yes. Yeah. Basic life support is a process by in which CPR is a part and your process of checking the environment and call of emergency. These are the first two points. You have to take the patient from an unsafe place to a safe place. Patient collapses on the middle of the road. You have to pull him to the skirt. Patient collapses during fire. So you have to take him to a safe place before you start CPR there. You always have to think about yourself also before you jump into any conclusions or doing CPR. So just the basics of the CPR, what we do is the compression, airway, and breathing. I'm telling this because in most of the emergency situations, this is the part which we need to check for every patient. You need to check the airway and you need to check the breathing, whether he's conscious, he's not conscious, whether you know how to check the pulse, you should at least know, you obviously know whether the patient is alive or not. So based on that, we talk about compression, airway, and breathing. The compression should be different for different adults, child, and infant, but mostly it has to be pressed down for two, two inches and 30 compressions per 100 per minute, and the child should rise between uh, each pressure, and you can give two breaths in between. I'm not going into the CPR. As I've said, it's just a basis of going to the next level. So this is how we talk when we talk about a cardiac rest when the patient collapses in the middle of the road. Next thing which happens in the road is a road traffic accident. Road traffic accidents are now quite less, but a uh, state of Assam, there is, uh, we are having, uh, we are saying that our road, uh, uh, the roads are becoming better. We are becoming very fast because of rash driving. We are having more accidents. But for the last 20 years, I think we, have, we are seeing much less of road traffic accidents, whatever the case may be. But yes, we should always take in context that we should have less of road traffic accidents, whatever may be the measure we take. But when it comes to a road traffic accident and you are on the side, on the curb, when you saw an accident, what are the main three things which come into context? The main three things are, one is head injury. Head injury is a traumatic head injury, which occurs when an object hit hard on the head. It is a condition where the patient immediately might not go into unconsciousness, but or can cause brain damage and leads to brain dysfunction. Patient may just patient may just have uh, confusions, nausea, headache. But the main aspect here is that you have to talk with the person to know about about the consciousness of the person. I think some of the speakers are unmute. Oh, thank you. So based on that, you have to ask if the patient is conscious, no issue. You can ask him about the pain, ask him about where, what is the condition. Do you know what happened or how, is it paining? Do you have any issues? If you're having dizziness, please come out of your car. If he's outside, if it's a hit and run, you are on the side of the car. If he's conscious, you ask him if he's not having any issues, you, you obviously will try to shift him. Why am I stressing on the shifting of the patient? Because if you are having a spinal injury or injuries which cannot be shifted, you cannot. A patient who is unconscious, who does not know what to do, you might need to shift the patient. Yes, but you should know when and where not. If you are it's in the middle of the road, obviously it's life-saving. You need to shift the patient from inside the car or from the middle of the road towards the side of the road. Otherwise, it's always better unless you assess the patient or the person who has hit, not to move the person from one side to another in an unconscious patient or a patient who is conscious, but lying and is not able to move by himself or herself, whether it's because of a head injury or any secondary injury. Next injury which comes is trauma and fracture. Here again is the same thing is that based on the processes which is happening, the trauma can be also in the chest, trauma can be in the abdomen, and then the patient can be having fractures. 
So what do we do? How do we know that the patient is having a fracture? The patient, if he is conscious, he will be telling you that there's pain at or near the seal of fracture. So he can't move that limb. He feels pain. There might be swelling, tenderness if you touch it in the area where there is a fracture. But there might be deformity, might not be. Sometimes we see that the hand or the leg or the finger is broken or in a different position. Then we know it's broken. Do not try to displace or replace limbs when you do not know how it is to be done. It's better that you treat the fracture or the spot if you do it, just steady the injured part and then immobilize the fracture part. If you see that it's a fracture part, please immobilize it and keep it there. Do not try to manipulate it to make it all right, but because it's difficult. Here again, main things come is that the your issue is to steady and support the part only. You are not going to treat it by putting a, a crepe bandage or you are, you are not trying to uh, giving a plaster there. You are just trying to immobilize. So it should be loose. It should just be something so that they cannot mobilize it. It's like a tourniquet. You do not apply it. It's just to stabilize the limb. If you add a tight tourniquet in an area which is already having short supply of blood, that limb will go into death. It will dry up, it becomes gangrenous, and it will die off. So it's always better to steady a limb and always start to immobilize the limb, not put a tourniquet and try to stop the bleeding supply. Coming to this, comes to the third part of our problem is the bleeding. Bleeding is something which you can see, is something which you cannot see. The bleeding which you see outside may be red and you know the patient is bleeding from the head, from the hands, from the limbs. There's a cut injury, but he can also be bleeding inside the brain, inside the abdomen, inside the chest. So those are areas which we do not know. But if you have a head bleeding, obviously the patient will be unconscious. Chest bleeding, he will be telling that he's having pain inside. Abdominal pain, he might be in a stage of shock. So if the patient is bleeding, when you see bleeding, you try to stop it with clothes, dampen it up. But please do not try to put a tourniquet and stop it unless you know what you are doing. If you put a tourniquet in a, in a small uh, in a injury, which is on a limb, and you stop the blood supply, that limb will go, become gangrenous and die off. But yes, if you have a fracture of the femur, where in the hip, there's bleeding, that leg is already gone, you have to put big uh, chunks of clothes or anything, push it down so that the bleeding uh, does stop because you are trying to save a life. The leg at that moment may not be an issue because if you are having uh, bleeding in such sites, the blood supply is spurious and you are not being able to stop the blood of the hip or in the leg, then the blood supply is already gone. The bigger vessels are gone. But if you put a tourniquet there, what happens is that even if there are small vessels which are at least supplying the uh, leg till it comes to a place where we can do definitive therapy, the leg becomes dead and there was no way to salvage the leg. So it's always try to save him the leg also by stopping the bleeding, but do not try to stop the uh, supply of the blood and reduce the bleeding. So this is the basis on which ATLS is made. I don't want to go through the ATLS like the BLS. So I just promoted the things which a bystander can do before actually knowing about the ATLS. The first three parts of ATLS can be done by any of a bystander, but the later parts require that you know. Most of the paramedics, I think, which are working in your university or being uh, taught in your university knows, because I also treat some of them. I, I, sorry, teach some of them. So they know the basics of what to do of an ATLS. So that part should be known, I think, by any person who goes into the road, because then it becomes easier for every common person in our society to know at least the basics of what we call as a first aid. So the first aid thing has come to an aid that is quite big right now. It's not just putting a cotton over it when you have a minor cut at the hotel, a hospital or at home, anywhere you get it. But it's also to know about emergencies and what to do during that period. So I've just gone through the basic of the first part of the ATLS, which is airway maintenance and cervical spine protection. The cervical spine protection is you won't be doing. The only issue is that if the patient is unconscious, please don't try to pull the person from one side to another. People try to do that. They pull the, take the hands on one side, legs on one side and try to 
keep him to a safe side. Yes, you need to do it. But if the patient is having a cervical spine uh, injury, the patient will be paralyzed from neck down and can also have that. So it's always better if you do not know about the position of the patient to please not move the patient unless it's life threatening. And yes, if it is there, you need more people to hold the patient together and then shift him to a safer side. Breathing and ventilation, same like the medical part, is that you need to know when the patient is breathing or not. And circulation, if you know, you will surely see the pulses. Even if you don't know, you will be seeing that the heart is and the breathing is coming up or not. If the patient, you have, there is no heartbeat, he's not breathing, you have to go back to your CPR. Checking of disability is the fracture that I talked about. And the exposure is the area of the patient where it has happened and also the exposure of the patient. What is the status of the patient? How much is it? What do you need to do? Is it just a bruising or there is injury? The patient is conscious, unconsciousness. He's having a leg which is on one side. So there must be a fracture inside. So that is what we need to know by full exposure. The assessment as such is not to be done by a layman on the road. It's not necessary, but we can absolutely know about the main parts, what is happening. We do not know to need to know whether the chest injury has caused rib case uh, fracture or not, or there is blood in the uh, abdomen. But we need to know if the patient is conscious, unconscious, he's having fracture, he's having lots of bleeding, and he's not maintaining uh, breathing also. What do we need to do? Then we come to another part, which comes to our hospitals often, is burns. Burns, we can talk about mainly three, thermal burns, uh, electric burns, and chemical burns. Thermal burns is also a big issue with suicide. I am not talking about all of them today. But yes, in suicide effects, also thermal burns do, do come in. But in general, minor burns are first or second degree burns that are smaller than the size of a uh, patient's hand. If the area is burned larger, then it obviously involves more. It's a major burn. And also if it uh, occurs in areas like the groins in the face, major joints, or you see that it's going quite inside, then it's a major joint. Take the patient to a near just emergency to have the evaluation. Yes, obviously. And please note that even a small minor burn has the potential to become infected. It's always advisable to seek medical attention as soon as possible. That is what we advise. But what do we do? The first thing that we do for minor burns first. Okay. We do this, the stop the burning process. So one, uh, first aid for burns is to stop the burning process, not to jump into the fire yourself. So always try to take in context that even if you go inside, you have to take precautions before trying to pull a person from inside a burning area. Because many suicidal cases, the person is may, yes, at the last moment want to live again, but mostly if he's on fire, they won't be listening to you and you are only endangering yourself more. But to stop the process, first and foremost is cool the burn with running water, cool water, whatever water you get, get or, or you can do smothering the flames with a blanket that is also done in many instances do not put the yourself at risk by holding the person trying to do something and getting burnt at well remove any clothing or jewelry and everything if if it's possible if the patient is light down, then you start doing this. Remove the clothing, anything which is burned around because metals become more hot. It'll keep on burning inside watches, rings, everything. Administer painkillers if you can. For burn without blisters, you can add uh, products, cover the burn with a sterile gauze bandage or clean cloth and wrap it up. And then you can shift the patient to a medical fraternity. Uh, if it is you have put lots of water, try to keep the person warm. Why? Because skin is the only uh, thing which is covering us all. If you have a major burn, the skin, if it goes, the patient becomes cold, it becomes chill. So we need to keep the patient warm. So till help arrives, try to keep the person warm, treat them for a pain. If you have a parastamol, that's no big issue. We can give it to them. And then Always, if there is burn in the face or upper part, ask the patient to sit up. Don't ask the patient to lie down much. If you are having uh, burns in the face, what happens is that if you ask the patient to lie down, uh, the page, the, there is swelling inside. 
the throat and the face, which causes suffocation and the, then re breathing problems. We have seen many patients who are brought to the emergency with burns. We need to intubate, but because of the facial burns, which is inside and the patient was lying down for a long time, the passages through which we need to intubate are blocked. So it's always asked that if you have upper body or face burns, please ask the person to sit up if possible. Or obviously, if the patient cannot sit up at all, you try to prop him up with a, uh, pillows or something like that. But mostly, uh, it will be better if, we can, if the patient can sit up. What not to do in a minor burn is not to apply ice. Do not use any ointments over it, over the blood. Do not break the blisters if it comes up. And as seen, please take medical attention. Do not say it's a minor burn. There's nothing done but it can give rise to problems. Another thing which comes to our hospital is electric burn, which we are getting more nowadays. Electric burns, maybe it's just a, excuse me, simple burn, which we get uh, a shock that we talk about. And two big power lines, uh, patient, persons, electricians working on power lines who get shocked. So there again are two issues. One is the patient is already stuck on the wire or on the uh, electric power line, or the patient, if it's a big power line, is pushed and thrown a long, far way off, which causes other injuries along with the electrical injury. So first thing which comes is that don't touch the injured person. If he or she is still in contact with the electrical current. Call your local emergency number. Yes, obviously you will do that. Don't go near high voltage wise unless the power is turned off. This is you call the electric uh, supply who gives it and ask them to stop the power line before you come at least uh, six meters or 20 feet near to the person or towards the line. Because uh, during that period, you can also get electrocuted. So it's better if the uh, if you take at least six meters away from that. And if there is sparking, then though you have to keep uh, more farther away than going nearer, trying to save, because you might get electrocuted in that. Don't move a person with an electrical injury. This is basically if the patient has been shot down, uh, thrashed down, and he's uh, somewhere far away from the lines, and you can go near him, please, unless he is in immediate danger in that area, don't try to pull him above. Okay, so because he's having a burn injury, he's burning inside. Okay, he might be having a head injury, all injuries, but always try to put him in a safe area. Immediately while waiting for medical help, as I've said, remove the source of electricity. If not, it's in a, just a wire which is already as shown in the photo, it's a broken wire. So try to push the person away from the wire from a dry non-conducting object, which is made of plastic, wood, or cardboard. So if, after you get to the person and you see that the patient is unconscious, again, we start with the CPR process. And as I've said, you have to take the risk, uh, know the risk of shifting the patient, yes or no. Try to prevent the injured person from becoming chill. Here again, burn, it causes the person to become chill and apply bandages if you see any burns which is outside. Mostly what happens with electric burns are that it causes a sudden cardiac arrest. It goes directly heart over the heart. Because even if you are touching one end of, uh, uh, of the power circuit, the, it goes out through another part. It has to come in and go out as we all know about it. So it may be in the hand and it goes out through the leg. So there's a circuit which goes throughout the body. During that period, we have a system of heart and nerves, which is also something like the electrical current. So it can cause any of the issues. It can cause severe burns inside without having anything outside. The patient can go have neurological symptoms of confusions. The patient have arrhythmias at that time, which can go into cardiac arrest. And because of, uh, I would say, the muscles are also killed off there is it can just get uh, what you call melt out because of the burning the muscles can melt out and causes muscle pain contractions and also neurological seizures and loss of consciousness so what we need to do is to sh shift the patient to a safe area check that he is conscious unconscious start with his cpr if required and keep the patient warm and if he's having other issues like he's having seizures as we'll be talking later of seizures what do we need to do we put him on the side, take him to a side, and then start uh, wait for him to get other equations. Th uh, uh, as we are talking about uh, electrical injury, 
then we have another one which is chemical the main issues of chemical is which we do not get must here is that we can give it get it even in a chemistry lab which i want to tell is that uh, we are not supposed to put uh, it might be acidic or a basic even if we know what is the cause of the chemical uh, which is causing the reaction or the burn we are not supposed to put the other one because the reaction then occurs on the body and then it uh, causes deeper injury it's always better in a burn to put water to doze out and if the patient is a person is having the chemical on his clothes to remove any clothing anything which is nearby which is causing which can cause more burn and then take him to a safe area and absolutely put water in him stroke is another issue which i wanted to talk uh, is because uh, it's a medical uh, emergency yes why stroke is done because it can be either due to a hemorrhage or it can be due to ischemia for us either the blood is there or the blood is not there but the main issue is that the symptoms of stroke why do we need it because it's preventable if we know the symptoms of stroke then the morbidity and mortality of a patient dying or having serious paralysis due to stroke can be reduced but that too if we know that the patient is having a stroke within 30 minutes of having it so that time period like a cardiac arrest is very important nowadays because there are medicines which can prevent the stroke from uh, progressing so we call it stroke in evolution during the evolution part if we get a person if you bring a person a common person can know and bring a person to a hospital then the uh, uh, mortality or morbidity or, or the chances of him having a full blown paralysis or stroke can be reduced so how do we know that there are main three things which i have been uh, talking about for a long period one is speech one is facial weakness and with arm weakness so spot or spoke which is given by the aha is american is be fast it was fast before now it's becoming be fast faster we get it the more faster it's better so balance a person who was just on your side of you says i am slightly off balance i'm not being steady i'm i'm trying to fall down so you always keep in mind that that he might be going for a stroke yes there are other reasons of having a collapse also he might be having a cardiac arrest also but if you are having other symptoms we can think of a stroke neurological stroke eyes the patient might say that he's having blurred vision or his eyes are uh, he's not being seen from one side he's having difficulty in seeing so that is another one the first is other ones which are there from before number one is face facial deviation his mouth is moving from one side you are seeing that he's not being able to move his face to from one side his arms or leg is weak he cannot get up from his sitting positions or he was holding a glass he can't take it pick it up or his speech is deformed he's having slurring of speech or he's stopping he's not being able to speak so those are some of the factors when you know that the patient is evolution of a stroke he might go into a full flown stroke so what do we do this is the time to call for ambulance immediately you cannot stop a stroke from evoluting but this is important because you can prevent the stroke by calling a emergency or take him to a emergency so that he can get a better management in our american associations aspirin was also given for a stroke so but in our indian context till now we are not saying that you need to give a aspirin to a person who is having a evolution stroke unless we know what is the status of the patient that is for stroke the next as i was talking before is convulsion convulsion yes we are having convulsion not because of a rta or a cardiac arrest but we are having epilepsy we are not seeing epilepsy or seizure disorders now do you suggest that we are having it less no we are still having lots of neurological disease full blown uh, uh, gtcs that we call seizures or focal seizures but which are not taken care of or they are being taken care of in the local or rural areas how because the people are now aware that if you have a convulsion what you need to do it's a medical condition where the body muscles contract and relax rapidly and repeatedly resulting in a uncontrolled shaking so it's basically something to do with the abnormal electrical impulses in the brain so that's why if you have a uh, electrical injury uh, uh, what you call shock uh, uh, when you have a convulsion so that can be because of your neurological aspect of a uh, having a electrical uh, current through your body so the most important uh, aspect is the patient starts 
shaking his body, but it might not be the whole body. It might be some part of his bodies, like behavioral changes. So suddenly he has behavioral changes. Suddenly there are eye movements or his grunting or his having snorting or his moving his head rapidly or one part of his hand or his leg is moving rapidly. He's not being able to talk. There is cleansing of the teeth and he starts falling down. So those are some of the symptoms where we can say that the patient is having a, having a seizure. My important aspect in a seizure is that none of their issues, none of us can stop the seizure from happening. Please do not try to stop the seizure. So what are we trying to do? What can we do for generalized tonic or grand mal or any seizure that we talk as Mrigivimar or we are saying as seeing in the people who are having seizures that they go into a full-blown seizure. That is what we mostly get in, uh, on the roads is that the first aid convulsion should aim at preventing further damage or injury and maintaining airways. So there are three aspects of our first aid for seizures. Number one is further damage. Okay, So the patient should not have more damage that is in his body. Injury, he, he will fall down. He was standing, he suddenly had uh, seizures and he will fall down. So the risk of falling and having injuries, take him to an area which is safer. And thirdly, maintaining his airways. The patient might fall down on a train station. The train might be coming. He was crossing the road. He just fell down. So those are areas where you have to think about injury. You might need to take the patient out from that area and shift him to a safer area. But how do you do that? The patient is having seizure. So please do not hold down and try to stop the seizure. Cushion his, uh, his head and try to pull him or turn him to one side. Stop everything on one side and then let the seizures occur. Stop him from falling down, injury his head. So that's why cushion his head, loosen any tight clothing so that he does not suffocate. He does not vomit or he does not eat up his vomitors. He does not suffocate on his vomitors. So always try to put him on one side. Time Caesar to know how long the seizure is occurring so that you can tell later to the healthcare workers that yes, he was having a seizure for this seconds, this minutes. Don't put anything inside the mouth. You cannot prevent the seizure. What you can do is, yes, you can prevent the uh, further injuries like uh, bleeding or a tooth break, clenching of seizure. But if you put your hand inside, you are injuring yourself. If you put a hard object inside the mouth, you will be breaking his teeth. So that is not done because tongue bleeding, uh, tongue biting and bleeding are some of the parts of a seizure. You cannot actually prevent that. What you will be doing is doing more harm to the person. So better to put him on the side and let him go over the seizure. It will stop at one time. It will not keep on continuing. Okay. So after that, first timing we need down so that he goes to a healthcare and then starts medications. For during that period, the main issue is to reassure the victim that you will have uh, until recovery because as the seizure ends the patient becomes conscious he will be confused which is post ictal confusion so during this confusion period he wouldn't know what happened he wouldn't know you the situation he was in so it's always your job to reassure that you had some problems you are better now we have called up the ambulance please go there and then you can later ask him whether he had a history of seizures or not so that you know that he had he might be having medications with him because some people of seizures in some countries should have a ID which shows or says that he is a seizure patient so that you can start medications immediately. He obviously might be having medications with them. Okay, That is what we need to do for seizures. So these are the part where we have neurological and cardiac diseases. Next week, we are coming to the, oh, there's another one, which is choking which can happen because of our environmental factors. You're eating and on in the front, uh, in the table in front of you, what happens is that an adult or a child is not coughing, is not being able to do something, he's coughing. And slowly the people near him are just telling him, okay, what is happening? Why are you coughing? But nobody is taking it seriously. And at one time his face become red and he collapses. That is what is choking. When an obstruction blocks the windpipe, causing a person to be severely short of breath. So I think everybody has learned about the Hemlix maneuver. The, I won't go through the Hemlix maneuver. It's just as it's shown in the photograph that you go behind a person who is choking and then with all your might, take a deep breath yourself and push in his stomach so that the amount of 
breath which is inside his throat, uh, I mean chest blows out through his nose and mouth and the obstructing thing which is lodged inside comes out. That is the basis on which the Hemlix maneuver or the compression which is shown here is done. But the main problem here is that you are not supposed to do the Hemlix maneuver unless it uh, clogs up absolutely. When the patient is just choking, his cuffing, his reflexes are still there. So if you do the uh, Hemlix maneuver in such a patient person, what happens is that he cannot cuff up at the same time when you are doing the Hemlix maneuver. You have to be trained for that. So if a layman does a Hemlix maneuver with a person who is just coughing, he's trying to take it out himself, you can do more harm than good. He can ingest it more. Moreover, don't try to put your finger inside a child's mouth and try to pull up a whatever food is going on. If it's a bone or a lump of meat, you cannot put your finger and go through it. So you'll be pushing it more. So it causes more harm than good. So what are the no's? Do not, that is more important in choking. Always try to put it this way. Put on yourself and always keep yourself safe. Put yourself in a chair while taking for a child. And if it's a young child or a baby or an infant, you always put him on your knees. Let him lie down in your knees and then you get it done. Always try it over his stomach and the patient's head and neck should be forward so that it comes out when you give your pressure. And while you are trying it, always ask for help uh, so that if anybody knows something more to do it. Because choking is, has another thing which is very important but needs somebody to know how it is done. Just above the level of our throat, there we can do a nick and open up his trachea if you are not able to open up his throat and help is not coming nearby. But here again, please, if you are a paramedic, do not put a needle inside a patient's throat. A needle uh, pricks through, so it will go through and through from your throat and there will be no work. So always make a nick with a knife and put something which has a hole in it, like a tube or even a, a straw and just something which will keep it open. A small amount of breath also will keep a patient breathing and alive till help arrives. You do not need to have something which is very big to go through the throat. So that is a maneuver which is very important, which is taught to all of the paramedics. But unless you know it, obviously, if you're uh, if you're not comfortable with cutting uh, someone's neck, please don't do it because the persons who are nearby will think you are cutting the neck the wrong way and because blood comes out and that may be a big issue for you and people might start beating you up. So while doing helping others, always try to help yourself first and know what you are going, doing before jumping for doing something. So that is choking. Taking into context the environmental parts, we are going into the different animal bites. All the bites we are taking it very simply. People come, take medicines and go back. And at home, I think many of them have home remedies, which we suggest. So we'll come to some of them. Dog bites, we all do this. Uh, give water, we uh, use, uh, wash it, put antiseptic and maybe take an anti-rabies vaccine from a pharmacy. But here comes when the rabbit dog is running around biting some people. So do you run forward? The person, they will also be biting you. So you should know what to do with those because dog bites account for up to 90% of all animal bites. Injuries may involve structures which are deep beneath the skin, including muscles, bones, nerves, and blood vessels. And just a rabipur or a medicine vaccine for rabies will not suffice when you have injury which goes down because it's a mouth of a wild animal. It's not only a dog bite, which I'm talking about, any wild animal, which suggests that you need injections. A uh, rabbit, rabbit, not rabbit, that is a rabbit uh, bite, you do not need, uh, I mean, uh, injections for vaccines, but any other wild birds, like uh, you have shrews and uh, big rats also biting you, then also you might need to have all wild birds should be washed clean. And if the bleeding has stopped, put antibiotic solutions and you should get medical care because we need to may need to give you uh, immunoglobulin also for the rabies because it's not treatable. So you should always come to uh, medical fraternity. And moreover, if it is on the face, head, neck, hand, foot or near a joint. So because in those areas, the vascular supply is very good. It can go directly. And before you know it, it can reach to your whole body. So it's always better to know when it has been given.
again another bite which we take yes snake has bitten what is the first thing we, uh, it is done in our rural area is that we talk about is to find the snake kill it and try to show it no those are immobilized we apply basic first aid and rush the patient to the nearest hospital that can deliver titis anti venom and emergency care that is what you need to do how to do it indian is one of the biggest areas or having the highest rate of snake bites so in the rural areas what they do is carry no right which has been coming in our government of india guidelines is carry no right why was the carry put in because we are already talking about right we all know about right i was just talking about right that uh, we send him to a hospital but the main issue what came up is that what we do what is being done is that patients are taken to uh, herbal medicines traditional remedies what to do you are putting a tourniquet bind the leg so that the di leg dies off by the time you come to a hospital then you are cutting the patient's leg you are doing uh, you put your mouth somebody puts his mouth on the bite mark and tries to take out the venom so the carry no right which comes out is carry the patient or the person to the nearest site do not allow the victim to walk even for a short distance just carry him in any form more if it is in the leg why because if you do not carry him the blood supply takes the venom all over the body no tourniquets no electrotherapy no cutting no pressure immobilization and no putting any sprays over it you are not allowed to do any first aid management do not waste time for doing first aid management the only thing you will be doing is that reassure the patient because 70% of all snake bites in india are from non venomous species so reassure immobilize the uh, limb or the area which is uh, bitten like a fracture limb which i had shown before use bandages to hold the splint not to stop the blood supply or to pressure uh, apply pressure and get to the hospital immediately do not go for traditional remedies at that time so do then those just what i have told about that's the same don't apply ice don't apply a tourniquet don't apply heat don't cut the affected area don't use a commercially available extraction device don't use electrical therapy don't apply any type of lotions or ointments please don't do all this you should better take the patient put a splint if it is the uh, uh, it's in the hand always put the position the affected area at or above the heart level so if it's lying down obviously it will be over the chest but if it's uh, if you are not try to elevate the foot as far as possible so the patient will be in the lying position okay no constricting devices that is snake bite then we come to and this is just a photograph i just took out but i think i am talking at length so i will skip it this is how you uh on the management how do you do the splinter this as you have just seen it's just like a splinter of a fracture that we are doing put a uh, just to immobilize we are never binding it anywhere like a tourniquet so that the blood supply does not go please don't do something like that just immobilize the patient uh, leg and so that the blood supply stays there and come to a uh, healthcare area then bee sting is also same thing that i'm talking about bee sting if a bee single bee stings no issues you take out from it especially if it is uh, on the lips and mouth you'll be having pain if it's on your head you try to take it out with a pair of tweezer okay apply pressure put ice on it but if it is lots of bees swarming together or if the patient is allergic he will have hypersensitivity reactions so if a bee stings it's always better put ice on it keep it cold if possible take it out with a tweezers if it is not you need antihistaminic ointment or to relieve itching and if it's a uh, uh, goes into hypersensitivity reaction he will need injection so please shift him to a healthcare facility avoid scratching the bites uh, because that causes more of your uh, reaction so always put ice or something which shoots it down so that the patient does not go for that i put this lastly which was because uh last week we had got a issue in assam where people were drowning because of a ferry incident but my issue here was putting up with drowning is not only the incident or the persons who have died by drowning during that period but for the person who went in to save people while drowning so drowning main issue is that is to know when a person is drowning yes if it's a massive one like like we saw in nimatigan obviously we are seeing patients drowning 
a patient going on. Could we save the persons who are drowning? No, we are saving the patients who are near drowning. Once the patient goes in, it's very difficult to get out. But for us to know that when we jump in to save someone, we should always know whether firstly, we know how to swim. And secondly, am I in a position to save them? There are many people who went in to save others, but could not come home. So what are the aspects of, or we should know when we talk about drowning? The chain of drowning survival, as said to all countries, is to recognize the signs of someone in trouble and shout for help. Because we are talking mostly about a single person, whether at sea or in a swimming pool or going out into the river, not as a mass casualty. Rescue and remove the person from water without putting yourself in danger. This is something everybody has to know about. Never put yourself in danger. How to? I'll just talk about it. Call the emergency medical services before you go inside the water, begin CPR after you take out the person outside and then transfer care to advanced life support. This is the basics where you are having the full support system in our setups. Is it possible? What do we do? What do we do when we issue? We call for help. SOS, we are not, do not attempt to rescue drowning person by entering the water if you are not trained to take out patient, persons who are also having drowning. Why? Because I just tell you why, because the person, if he's uh, at that time, not near drowning, he will be thrashing. The, while he's uh, separating the near drowning from the person who is not drowning, because if the patient is thrashing and you try to hold him from the front, then either he will go in or you will go in again. And by the time he, you will be able to pull him, you are already very exhausted. So never try to pull a person from the front when he's trying to save himself. Always try to hold him from behind. If you are a swimmer also, please try to hold him from behind and then pull the person to safety. Always take your safety first. If the patient is near drowning, he will be in a stage where he won't fight out. Then obviously it will be easier for you to take him out of the water. But then also always try to from the backside towards the head and then the patient's body, obviously if he releases it, comes up to the front of the water. It goes up, his legs goes up immediately if you try to pull him up. Then it becomes easier for you to pull him. This is already known by a person who is trained to take out persons or a swimmer who swims to take out persons who, who are his friends or while going to the river, how to take out a person. But we should always take into mind during mass casualty that when you are a swimmer, you are going in after taking out three persons, you are exhausted. And that is what happened to one of the persons who went in to save in the Nimatik hut where he lost his own life. Throw a flotation device where you get people like that or you are having jackets or you're having in an area where you have all those things. If not, take a long pole or a bamboo which does not go down, which floats, put it off for him and then you can pull him out of the river. Once the drowning person is in dry land, then again your resuscitation comes like a cardiac patient. You have to know about the uh, basics of BLS. Try to find out whether he is having any issues while drowning down and then put him on one side. Try to take him, take his water out. And if he's unconscious, start CPR if required. If the patient was swimming in cold water, get blankets or otherwise help. Bring the body's temperature back to never. He's already exhausted. You are pulling him up. Are, there is water there. He's in, unconscious in a stage of shock. So we should always try to put him in a normal temperature. So what I was talking about today for, I think, around 45 minutes at length about SOS, emergencies in the healthcare. So emergencies in the healthcare it can be many other incidents, as I've said, in a household for our parents, even a cut or a fever for a child is an emergency. To bigger issues where there's a big fire going around or there's a fire drill going around, uh, there is a disaster drill going around. So there are different drills we are doing on so that we know about how to get about and do everything to treat a patient or care about a patient when such a reason occurs. So from my presentation, I just wanted to suffice some, not all. There are many other uh, health issues which we can I can keep on at length, go around, but it'll take a long time. I don't want to go through all. But yes, there are many others by which, but the basics of treatment or the care is to keep up uh, oneself updated on the basic life support and what to do and mostly what not to do when nature calls and there is an emergency. So with this, I think I have 
incorporated most of the things which are inside in uh, queries of our healthcare. But as I've said, health is not the only area where we have uh, calamities or emergencies. There are many household emergencies which come out where I may not be a good person to talk about. Like basically my issues will be when I get a my car breaks down on the middle of the road and I do not know what to do. So it's there for everybody in our life that we don't know where they, it comes up. I may be apt in the health sector, but maybe I won't know anything to do at that time. So helping another in an emergency is not only in the health sector, but everywhere to look out for each other and see what to do and how to do. So with this, I think I have gone through more, I have uh, talked at length about the health and what I am uncomfortable or comfortable with. Thank you all for our patient hearing. Back to you, Dr. Sunanda Buru. Thank you so much, Dr. Bodago. That was just amazing. I mean, the amount of information that you had given us was um, really outstanding. And uh, I hope so. uh, and I'll try, I tried to keep everything in mind. It was too many information, but Honestly, I learned a lot. I'm sure all of those who are present here, they also learned a lot. And now we will open up for some quick questions. Yes, if anybody yeah, sure. has. Yeah, sure. So any questions? I'll stop the screen sharing. Yeah, please. Yeah. So any questions from uh, anybody kindly ask? Uh, either they have understood everything. Okay, yeah. somebody is asking because my issue is that uh, there are lots of things going on together. So I try to keep it as much as possible sim uh, simple without going into our medical jargon. So I hope uh, that's also done because uh, as I've yeah. known today, this is not only a health sector once, the viewers are also from non health health sectors also. So I wanted yes. to make it for all. That's why I wanted the thing about uh, the differentiating between a healthcare worker, what he knows, and a common people. I want everybody to know about the basics of the life support. So that was Absolutely. what I'm stressing about. And you did it amazingly yes, well, wonderfully I done. So. Yeah, I think Dr. Nisar would like to ask something. Dr. Yes. Dr. Bhattakur, it's a very, very, yes. very interesting talk and you touched many aspects. Though you, Thank you. said that you are indoor, but you talked very details about the outdoor accidents and other details. I think you, are, you can hear it, right? Yes. No. Is it audible? Yes, 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 absolutely. Is it audible? No, no, yes, Hello. it's audible. Is it audible? Bhattakur, is it audible? Yes, I can hear it, yes. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you something. You know, yeah. now in the southern part, I found that after the brain damage, most of the times, you know, <laughs> the other organs are being uh, immediately taken out and then uh, donor donor in you know a lot of lives are being saved yes. lives are being saved and then you know suppose you know the hand mutated you know amputated has been now what about in the northeast in india is it happening now yeah well, what is this that uh, is the state of assam still they have not clarified for the brain dead oh. persons i'm the one of the committee members for the brain dead so the okay. requisite from the central governments are very clear but they have not yet given us uh, rights to give a transplantations form uh, dead or not dead what your brain dead uh, disease owners we can deceased donors and brain dead donors are two types of donors based on which as you have talked about we can have yes, different yes. types so what happens in the yeah. rta what they are doing is that they keep the brain survive for that part so that other organs okay. are stable till we take them okay. to an area yeah, where yeah, they can yeah. be harvested yeah. we are calling it harvesting yeah. so that harvesting yeah. part is not being cleared up here in assam so that's why we are not doing that but okay. we have the yes. protocol and everything is done on papers oh. we know that it has been done uh, but till now, we are having renal transplantation, liver transplantation okay. from live donors only. The harvesting of organs from RTA yeah. patients or from yeah, brain dead no, patients is uh, not yeah. been done. Yeah. Yeah. I remember downtown hospital has done some liver transplantation. I yes, uh, last week we had yeah, yeah we had renal transplant also last week. We are doing that. Both are uh, live donors. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you. Good. Uh, Other questions you'd like to have? Yeah. 
we can expect more from the nursing sector i think uh, yes from nursing paramedics yeah paramedics yes. it's very important field what you know that yeah. because his talk was something very 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 interesting because many very things interesting. Touch, so was... many, many things is that even the snake bite and you know that bee bites this all are things are you know i have not expected that that will come but he talked very detailed <laughs> absolutely i really hope so <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about whatever comes to the hospital and trying to uh, take it to no, the periphery no, and what no. we can do. So Some of the points you said very right. Whenever the snake bite comes, you know, the old people, young generation, the, the old people will uh, do, make the things more complicated. What yes. you said is very true. Yeah. That's the main issues we have uh, yeah, coming yeah, up. Yeah. So, you know, uh, if you have any issues with your car, you can call me up. That is my phone. Oh, thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. I don't know anything about that. Okay. Great, great. Surely I will that is one of my passion, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions, uh, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir? Would you like to say something? Oh, I don't have any question. It was, uh, 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 I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sapna of Bhattakur. My it was a lot of practical <laughs> tips also for emergencies outside hospital. Thank you very much, Dr. Bortikur. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. So if no more questions, we would like to uh, thank Dr. Bortikur for this wonderful session. And we will look forward to many such more interactions in the future. I hope and, so. Uh, so from all of us here at Assam Nantan University, we are also a part of our university. Uh, yes, yes. I so I want to offer my heartfelt thanks to you for giving your time amidst your busy schedule. I Thank you so much. And special thanks to all the people who have attended this session. I'm sure all of you had a lot to take with you after this lecture. So thank you once again. And thank you everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Die Hand.